and welcome to the next window in the Two Fat Lardies Advent Calendar windows for 2022. And behind today's window, ooh, hello, it's Scratch Building. How do you go about it? Well, one of the first things I ever did when I met Richard and Nick at Lard Island about 25 years ago, well, one of the first things after attempting to pass my War Games Club probation examination, which Richard and Nick sent me, I still haven't got the results from that, so I am still technically probably on probation. Um, but one of the first things I did when I was at the club was to try and spruce up the club's terrain cupboard. When I say cupboard, I do mean that quite loosely. Uh, anyone who's been to Lard Island will know there's a ramshackle collection of sort of sub-IKEA furniture in one of the corners. We have actually replaced one of the cupboards over the years, but I think one of the originals is still there. The cupboard door doesn't quite fit, but inside... Um, the collection of terrain that was in there when I arrived was fairly sort of kind of beaten about and probably a bit moth-eaten. So I felt, well, you know, I'm not going to be trying to do big games at the club or tell people which rules to play. But what I can really do to help is to scratch build some terrain and uh, try and improve the club store of terrain which is available for the games. And that was something that I really enjoyed and I thought that was something that I could really give back to the club in a very early sense in the first few years when I was a member of the club. And I can remember one of the first projects I did was uh, uh, to about three or four different rows and vineyards, um, uh, rows of olive trees and vineyards for a game which was set on the island of Crete in the Second World War. And I really enjoyed doing those, uh, although they were quite a small project, uh, just creating something which would look great in 15 millimeter and just evocative of the olive groves and uh, vineyards that you can see in Crete if you go there on holiday. And a number of people said to me, well, can you do a bit more? And I said, oh, okay, okay, we'll add a bit more. And, and before I knew it, I was building baseboards, I was doing all sorts of things with trench terrain, I was building 28 millimeter buildings. And the terrain company gave me a real opportunity, as, it, as did Richard's Sheds, to be able to create terrain for the club uh, and to build up what we were using uh, on some of the club nights and through scratch building. And over the years, I've written various articles in Lard magazine relating to how to scratch build. And I think ultimately there's no hard and fast rules but I think one of the things at the start is to have an idea where you're going. Uh, I like to sketch things out in a notebook. I like to plan out importantly the size of the terrain which is needed um, and I say that quite carefully because it's all very well saying well I want to build these particular fortifications or I want to build uh, a wargaming terrain item which is a series of houses or I want to build a forest it's all great with coming up with the idea but to me the terrain has to serve the game and has to serve the table as opposed to just being a piece in its own right uh, whatever is on the table needs to fit commensurately with the rest of the table um, and ideally it's got to have applications which extend beyond just one game or one particular uh, type of of war game. It's got to be able to serve for big battle games but also for smaller skirmish games. So you're getting the most use out of your terrain and trying to fit the terrain within a particular frame or footprint on the tabletop is I think a really well worthwhile thing to do at the start of the project. You're trying to think about how that terrain is going to look and be used in different games and that to me dominates what I build. I will try and think of something which is really going to fit within the game, within the overall scenic look of the terrain. But I want to think about its dimensions, the footprint, the area of the terrain piece which is going to be created. That's the most important thing because if you get that right, I think to myself, uh, that is going to go a long way to making that piece of terrain usable on various repeated occasions. It's going to increase the utility. It's going to interact with other pieces of terrain so it looks part 
of the same sort of setup as opposed to just something which has been plonked down in a generic way. As to the process, I like to um, build uh, a prototype. If I'm doing something which has repeated components, I like to build the first one and make sure that that works because almost inevitably when I've built scratch built terrain items, there's been a problem with the first one um, and that gets corrected on the second one. So rather than start the four buildings for the village all at the same time, I like to do one and then learn from the mistakes. I also like to note things down in notebooks. I've already mentioned that, but it's always worth mentioning a good point twice. I like to note things down in notebooks, and I make copious notes when I've made terrain about the things which went wrong and the things which really worked well. And that might just be simple things, such as where I bought particular components or what paints did I use or what varnish finish uh, I would employed on a particular building. So when I go to actually the process of building... Uh, I look at old photographs that I've taken, I look at my notebooks and try and recreate um, whatever worked from the previous project. And that also helps in making the items of terrain look similar as regards being homogenous, the same materials and the same look and dimensions as something which I've created previously. As regards the tools to use for scratch building, I think you've probably all got them available on your hobby table. Things like a hacksaw, various files, uh, a number of small pin drills, uh, sandpaper, tons and tons of PVA glue. I also really like epoxy resin. That's kind of one of the least favourite sort of glues these days. Loads of people obviously using super glue and stuff like that. But epoxy resin is brilliant for just creating bonds that once you set them, they're never going to break apart. Epoxy resin is basically one of the best glues that I use and just using Araldite which is the version which you can get in the UK. It's not particularly cheap but I do feel once I've set something with an epoxy resin that's really just going to hold there uh, and that's never going to really break apart. So that's something which I do use quite a bit in scratch building. Other materials that I found really useful and uh, commercial plug here the war bases, roofing materials, windows, doors, they're really, really useful rather than just endlessly having to recreate doors and windows. Um, and other manufacturers of similar items to war bases um, are available on the internet uh, and also on Etsy as well. There's lots of different little bits and pieces that you can find just to plug into a building which, which really make it look authentic. Uh, without having to scratch build absolutely everything yourself. And I would say that that's a really good way of speeding up the scratch building process. And then painting, I think, is a really important part of scratch building. I mean, once you've built the model, you really want to, uh, at least I do, I really want to try and set that building in the same context as the war game itself. And that really means approaching the building once it's been created as if it's a big model and painting it in a comparable fashion to the figures on the table. I think there's a number of ways to do that. So in one of the Lard Island um, manuals, well, sort of Christmas manuals from a couple of years ago, I talked about looking at authentic paintings to get the paint scheme right for 17th century buildings to make sure that um, your, the, the colours which are being used exactly match the colours which contemporaries were painting uh, in the 17th century. Also, I like to try and use the precise colours which match with certain elements you know, on the figures themselves. So it may be that when you are creating a wood effect on a scratch-built building, you're trying to replicate the same sort of wood on one of the wagons in the, in the army that you've painted up or the, the, the wooden stocks of the rifles which you've which have been carried by the figures on the table. There's just some nice little comparisons and connections that you can make between the figure painting and scratch build painting, which I think is a fun thing to do. And trying to get the same tone um, for the scratch built building as the other terrain items, I think is a really important aspect. So you can really anchor the scratch building into the terrain. Now that might be just as simple as to try and have the same colour base 
for the building as the baseboard which you're using. It might be to even use some of the same paints that you're using for some of the ground terrain work um, in or around the scratch built building. Uh, my good friend Jim Iberson is a master in doing that to try and use the same paints for the scenic items as for the terrain to really integrate uh, the buildings into the terrain. That really, really works. And I think one thing I've tried to do over the years, which is a tip from theatre designers, is to try and make some of the buildings um, be the backdrop to the action. Now, that doesn't mean that those buildings are unattractive or they're plain, but it also does mean that you're thinking about the figures being the real focal point of the game and the scratch building as being, if you like, the theatre backdrop. So you can mute uh, and tone down the colours on the scratch buildings, whereas the colours on the figures you want to almost exaggerate so that the figures come to life, render in the setting of the terrain and the scenic items like buildings. And that was certainly one of the tricks that I tried to use with the Musketeer version of Flashing Blades, which is kind of theatrical in a number of different ways, and I thought that worked. That was quite a fun thing to do. So I hope that's helped as regards scratch building. And I think the big question is why bother with it at all? I mean, there's so many brilliant 3D printing kits available and there's so many um, fantastic MDF kits out there as well. Why bother scratch building at all? Well, I think scratch building brings its own uniqueness and certainly it puts a stamp on a project which when people look at the table, they're going to take notice because it's something which is unusual it's something which reflects you know what you've done and it's a really fantastic part of the hobby which just is something to look back on when you are looking through um, the cupboards of different terrain you can always spot these scratch built ones and they have a charm and a loveliness which is unique and all of their own so that's the end of this window and good scratch building and good luck to everyone who's listening mm -hmm.